Okay, well, hello students. Um, thanks for your patience. We're just trying to get all this uh, technology figured out. This uh, whole online Zoom stuff is brand new for me. Uh, so hopefully we can get all the uh, kinks sorted out and we can make this a good experience for all of us. Um, this is particularly difficult for me because I really enjoy meeting and interacting with students. And uh, so this is all very, very different anyway. So today I want to uh, talk a little bit of the course outline and actually start the first lecture and kind of give you an idea what to expect for this course. Um, and uh, maybe talk a little bit about uh, how I think this is going to work in terms of Zoom and all that. Uh, so you may have noticed I have the Zoom settings automatically that your microphone is muted. That way, you know, we don't have 50 people coughing or sneezing or their cat meowing or dog barking in the background and uh, all those things interrupting everybody. Uh, if you do want to talk um, and ask a question, please feel free to do so. Uh, there is a chat function, but quite honestly, I probably won't notice. Uh, you know, I have lots of things going on on my screen. And if you're typing in on the chat, I probably won't notice uh, what people are actually saying. I can see somebody says here, I can't hear anything. Is that true for anybody else? Might want to turn on your volume. Okay, some people can hear and some people cannot. So that might be on your end. Uh, if you can't, um, if you can't hear something. So sorry about that if you can't hear something. Um, like I said, I probably will have a hard time using the chat function. There's just too many things going on on the screen. So it's just best if you do have a question that you do unmute and just, uh, you know, feel free to interrupt me or just wait for a moment and ask a question. I do encourage questions. That does help me, uh, does help me, uh, you know, kind of figure out what's going on, how well people are listening and uh, to get rid of any uh, kind of misconceptions and things like that. Uh, other than that, I'm still, I'm very new to Zoom and hopefully we can uh, work out any kinks. Uh, you may have also noticed when you uh, accepted the meeting um, that uh, the meetings are going to be recorded. So my intention is to uh, take the recordings and then, uh, and then post them uh, so that people can uh, view the lectures later or if they miss them, then they have that chance as well. So if you don't want to be recorded, then don't ask questions in lecture. You can always uh, email me or give me a call later as well. Okay, so I'm going to try this and see, uh, okay, where do I need to go next here? Okay, so I think I'm just trying to figure out how to share my PowerPoint. I just lost my Zoom here for a second. Okay, share screen, PowerPoint. Let's try that. Okay, so here we go. Uh, we're going to get started here uh, and I want to talk about the course outline and what to expect in this class. And uh, so let's get into that. So here I am. There's a picture of me. Um, my name is Blaine McGarry. Uh, I got my PhD at the University of Guelph and uh, I studied bacteria, penicillin, a whole bunch of things like that. So I'm a microbiologist, this is what I do, this is my area of expertise. So I'm hoping that you enjoy the course and you ask lots of questions and I'm hoping that you find the course uh, very relevant to uh, what's going on in the world right now with the, uh, with the pandemic and all that. Uh, so the lectures are scheduled for Tuesdays and Thursdays, 10.30 a.m. Uh, and they will be live via Zoom. Uh, I have office hours as well. And uh, you, can, you can phone me uh, to my office phone, or if you want to request a Zoom call as well, we can do that uh, during my office hours. Uh, other times by appointment, because I have classes and other responsibilities around the campus that I may be uh, uh, busy doing. So I know you're probably thinking, what's the class all about? We're going to cover a whole bunch of things. If you take a look at the course outline, it does talk about the syllabus and all the various things that we are going to be uh, uh, doing and talking about, so we're going to talk about all these uh, types of infectious agents and microorganisms, so viruses and bacteria, protists, uh, worms, things like that, and uh, we're going to talk about how we can kill them, how we can drug them, uh, what our body does to defend against them, and a whole bunch of other things. I hope you find it really fascinating. So this is 
something that I messed up a little bit on the uh, course outline I sent everybody initially. I sent you a draft and so I apologize for that, but these are the correct dates here uh, of your evaluations. So yeah, you have a quiz next Tuesday. So one week from today, it's gonna to be mostly on Thursday's lecture material. Uh, so what is the quiz about? I'm gonna talk about that a little bit uh, right now and a lot more on Thursday. Uh, but it's mostly going to be kind of like a biology review quiz. So a little bit of stuff from uh, biology uh, 30 and biology 20, uh, mostly things like, you know, what are the parts of the cell? Uh, what is transcription? What is translation? What is DNA replication? Uh, it's just a 10 question quiz and uh, that will be uh, next Tuesday. Uh, so a lot more on that on Thursday because that's what we're going to be talking about on Thursday's lecture and I'll give you a list of exactly what you need to study for for that test. So if it's all fresh in your head, uh, you should do really well on the quiz. If it's not fresh in your head, I know some people maybe did not finish high school so much recently, uh, then um, you know, you'll probably have to catch up a little bit. And that's the whole reason why I have this quiz is so that people get a chance to uh, catch up and kind of make sure they're familiar with some of the language we're gonna be using in the course. Uh, there are two midterms. You can see the dates there, Thursday, October 1st, and Tuesday, October 27th. Uh, so more on those as we get a little bit closer to them. And I do have one assignment and I will be handing out the assignment uh, next week. So I'll talk about that uh, next week. Okay, so I've had a few people email me and ask me about the textbooks. There's the textbook there. It's uh, called Microbiology, a Clinical Approach. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty good textbook for this class. Um, there's a lot of microbiology textbooks out there. A lot of them are very uh, scientific, which is fine, uh, but maybe not as suited towards uh, people who are looking at careers and uh, cl clinical uh, areas and uh, I found this one a few years ago and I think it is it is pretty good plus it covers the material decently. It's not the best textbook. I find some of the graphics, you know, the uh, first edition, the, the color scheme seems funny complaining about the color scheme, but uh, color scheme was brown and orange so you can imagine how amazing that was. Uh, second edition they had a lot more nice colors and uh, they uh, uh, made some significant edits which I think is a lot better. But you can use either edition uh, quite honestly, I don't follow the textbook uh, exactly. Uh, I have a lot of my own notes. I do use material from the textbook, and, um, but I don't follow it exactly. All of my tests are based on the lectures and the lecture material. Uh, my tests are not based necessarily on the um, textbook readings. Uh, that being said, my notes are not complete. And I, I, the way that um, I expect students to use textbooks is to basically, uh, you know, before or after a lecture, review the areas in the textbook that are referenced. Uh, maybe not necessarily read the whole thing, but flip through it and look for parts that are kind of, uh, uh, you know, maybe I talked about something and you didn't quite catch what I was talking about. Or maybe I talked about something and I didn't really cover it completely. So you're gonna go in there and you're gonna supplement uh, the lectures with that. Sometimes uh, I may show you uh, pictures or there's better pictures in the textbook. And so this is how it is, it is useful. There are many, many other resources out there uh, for microbiology. If you don't feel that you need the text, that's fine. Um, but uh, you know, it is, it is gonna help you. you know, honestly, the difference between an A and a B and a C sometimes are just people who go above and beyond uh, what, it, um, what the average student does. And I'll talk about grades uh, in a minute or two here. So uh, hopefully everyone has found Moodle. Um, you can log into Moodle using your Keanu credentials. I'm gonna go to Moodle now. Let's see here, I gotta figure out how to share my internet explorer. Uh, where is it here? There it is, okay. So there's Moodle. This is what Moodle looks like for me. And so this is the home page. I go down and I find my classes. So you can see over there, there's our class right there. So I'm gonna click on it. Hi, Dr. Blaine. Some of so the that load up. are experiencing uh, no audio. Uh, experiencing what now? Uh, no audio, right in a chat box. 
Oh, okay. Um, let's see here. I can't find the chat box. It disappeared for me. Hmm. Okay. The strange thing is my chat box is entirely empty. Wonderful how technology is sometimes. Yeah, I have nothing uh, in my chat box. It's totally empty. It's just asking me if I want to start a chat. So I apologize for that. Um, back to Moodle. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway, here's, here's Moodle. Uh, it's basically the course page. So you can see I've got uh, the welcome letter. I have uh, the course outline. I'm going to have uh, information about the assignment. I have the link to the lectures. And if you go down, you can see there are the uh, lecture notes. So I have my notes in two forms. I'll just show you what they look like. Uh, one form is a PDF. Uh, so this is more the complete notes in terms of I have lots of information there. So if you scroll down, you can see I've got lots of information about uh, what I'm talking about. And it follows my PowerPoints basically uh, word for, well, not word for word but uh, uh, point for point. Um, so what I encourage you to do with those notes is that you uh, uh, print those off ahead of time. And then as we go through lectures, you use that to, uh, to write notes along uh, as, we, uh, as we discuss things. Oh, I somehow my chat popped up. Not sure exactly. Okay, it looks like some people are, are helping each other out. So thank you very much on that. I will try to have the PowerPoints posted before the lecture. Uh, sometimes it might only be five minutes before because I'm always making little revisions at the last minute or trying to figure out what, uh, what I want to cover uh, that particular day. Um, I was able to get today's PowerPoint up for uh, topic one, so you can, you can uh, take a look at that when we get there or you can download it now if you like. Okay, so I'm gonna, just going to go back to uh, the PowerPoint. Uh, where is it? Um, there it is there. So another thing that uh, many of you have discovered is I do have a Facebook group. Uh, this is 100% optional. Um, if you're on Facebook and, and you uh, enjoy interacting on Facebook, this is a great place for you. Uh, my whole idea is, you know, I, I want you guys to be thinking about microbiology every day of the week if you can. Um, you know, it gives me great pleasure to hear students in the hallways talk about E. coli or you know, viruses or anything like that. And uh, so this is my chance to try to interact with you on a more regular basis. Uh, every day or two, I'll try to post something. Uh, I have a lot of cartoons and humor. Uh, sometimes it's YouTube videos. Uh, sometimes people ask me questions about the test and things like that. Uh, so I will be uh, trying to, uh, you know, keep that up to date on a, on a uh, cover, you know, with the topics that are relevant that we're looking at a lecture. So I do encourage you to join the group and, and, and check it out and uh, hopefully you can get a little bit uh, from that, a little bit of extra. Okay, so one thing that you will need to do, um, there's no rush for it at the moment because the assignment's not due till November, but we do have a uh, course on how to recognize plagiarism that we require all our students to do in this department. Uh, so I'm just gonna go back to Moodle for a second. And uh, where is it now? Uh, there it is. Okay, back to Moodle here. And if you go to the home page, so I'm looking here on the right, there under students. So you can see right there, plagiarism tutorial certificate. That's how you find the course. So you'll have to do that at some point. Uh, I've been told it can take a little bit of time, so budget at least an hour, maybe a little bit more for that uh, to do so. And uh, I usually ask students, you can hand in any time or you can hand in with your assignment. So I won't be marking your assignment unless you actually hand that in. So do make sure you do the course. I will remind you before, uh, you know, before the assignment is due again in, in November. Uh, but anytime you do it, you can just email it to me and uh, I'll check you off on my good list. Okay, like I said, there are many, many resources out there uh, on the internet and, and other places. 
Uh, if you have another microbiology textbook from another class or from a, a sibling or something like that, you can run it by me and tell me what, ask me what to think about it. Uh, here are some resources that I found on the internet you can check out that have lots of good information. Um, just keep in mind, you know, there are lots of people on the internet with lots of opinions. You know, Bob can have a blog and he can be wrong about a lot of things. Uh, these ones here I've personally looked at and I think they're pretty good resources. Uh, you can get good resources from uh, uh, Health Canada is not too bad. Uh, the CDC uh, in British Columbia is, is pretty good. Uh, and there's lots of good resources. So, uh, you know, if you do like to go to Wikipedia, that's great, but don't stop there. Follow the sources. Wikipedia has lots of references. You can see what the sources are and, uh, and go into uh, and find, you know, good uh, quality uh, information. Uh, anytime you have questions, just, just let me know if you don't know what is, if the source is any good. Uh, you know, like I said, the internet is a big place. Lots of people out there with conspiracy theories and other things. So it's good, uh, it's good if you um, uh, make sure the source is actually pretty sound. So let's talk a little bit about the syllabus here. Uh, first couple of weeks is, is uh, first week in a bit is, is pretty much introductory. Uh, like I said, I'm gonna uh, talk about what microbiology is today and talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, some biology review in topic two. Then we're gonna have our quiz. Then we're gonna talk about the microbes in a lot more detail. We're gonna talk about what are bacteria versus viruses versus protists and yeasts and worms and things like that. And then we'll have our midterm. Part two, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, controlling, growing and identifying microbes. Uh, so a little bit about things like microscopy and uh, uh, antimicrobial drugs. And then we're gonna have our second midterm. Unfortunately for you, it's a little bit earlier this year, just the way the dates have fallen. It usually ends up after uh, a little bit into, uh, uh, a little bit into November, uh, but we've started a little bit earlier, I've noticed this year. Then the last part, we're gonna talk a lot about more about disease. So um, how disease is transmitted, how we get it, uh, what are, how our body responds to it. And uh, so that includes the immune system as well. And our last topic, topic 14, is really kind of a little bit of review, a uh, little bit of new stuff. It's, uh, we're gonna kind of talk about things in a different way than we've talked about for uh, the entire course. Then we're gonna have our final exam. Uh, date has not been set yet, the registrar does that, so hopefully we'll have that information soon. Um, I'm also hoping our final exam will maybe be in person, then I'll get a chance to say hi to some of you. We have requested our department to do the final exam uh, in person, but I'm not sure if that's gonna happen. Um, still working out the details. We're figuring this thing out as we go along. So here's the big picture. We've got the microbes, so the viruses and the bacteria. We've got us. How do we study them? How do we kill them? Uh, what do we do about them? Uh, we've got the battleground. So how do they cause disease? How, how does our body defend itself? And these all really have to do with infections. So this is the big picture for medical microbiology, all the things we're gonna be talking about. Lane, for so, the um, Yes? Sorry, uh, for the midterms, are those in person? Uh, the midterms are going to be virtual online, uh, probably through the Moodle system. Uh, again, something I'm still working out the details on. It's been, uh, you know, like I said, figuring this out as we go along. So uh, I know you yeah, have, okay. probably have lots of questions, but we have a little bit of time to figure out the details. Thanks. So we are going to be doing this virtually, which you know, is going to be difficult uh, for you and it's going to be difficult for me. I'm just imagining as a student sitting there in front of your computer screen for all of your classes for how many hours a week. Um, so hopefully we can, we can make the best of this. Uh, I took this uh, little workshop a few years ago and they're talking about, you know, what do good students look like? And so I thought I'd share this list with you. And there are a few things on there I wanted to uh, point out um, that uh, might be important for this class. Obviously listening and, uh, and, uh, you know, paying attention to lectures. Uh, I'll be honest with you, uh, I do give a lot of information in my lectures, uh, which can be overwhelming to students. Um, but uh, if you take notes, taking notes is really good. If you just sit there and stare at the screen, uh, studies show you remember something like 5% of everything that is said. 
uh, even by taking notes, even if they're bad notes, and you never look at your notes again, you might double the amount that you will remember. If you take good note notes and review your notes, you're going to start to increase the amount that you can that you can remember. Plus, you need something to do. You're just going to sit there and slouch and slouch and more or whatever. Uh, it's going to be a lot more more difficult. So, doing something active and constructive, like taking notes, is going to be very important. Uh, handling procrastination. Uh, you know, this really is for all your classes, getting assignments done on time, studying in time, making sure that you're not leaving your studying to the last minute uh, and, and things like that. Uh, note taking, I guess I mentioned that already. I encourage you to print off the PDFs and uh, then that way uh, you have something to write notes on as I'm talking about the, uh, the concepts in the lecture. Planning and scheduling, good for all students, is uh, time management. Reading comprehension. So we are going to have a lot of uh, interesting words and vocabulary uh, in this course. So that's really what I mean by reading comprehension. And test preparation. Uh, and we have, you know, that's a big part of the course. So obviously learning how to study. And we'll talk about studying and some things that you can do uh, for that as we uh, get ready and prepare for the midterm. Okay, so one other thing to think about. Um, this again was another uh, workshop I went to where they were talking about uh, students and technology and all of the trends. And uh, you're going to be, uh, you know, very close to your technology this semester and think about all of those things that you're, you're on. And, uh, you know, this is something to think about, right? How many times a day are you on Snapchat? Um, is this affecting your learning? You know, if you, uh, you know, put your phone away while you're in lectures, it's going to help you to uh, pay attention to what's going on. Like I said, taking notes and focusing, you know, this is your time right now. Um, you know, to focus on microbiology, for example. And so I want you to be able to do that. Um, you know, picking up your phone, Googling something is great, um, but spending the entire time on Facebook or Snapchat is probably not the best for learning. And, uh, you know, um, it's, it can be disruptive to others too. So just something to think about. Okay, why is this? Oh, there we go. Okay, so I want to talk about grading. Lots of people want, uh, you know, everyone wants an A plus, um, and that's great. Uh, but I want to talk to you about what that means. Uh, so for this course, you can see I have in red, uh, it is uh, considered one of the foundational nursing courses and you are required to get a C plus uh, in order to progress in the nursing program. Uh, so that is pretty significant in terms of percentage that's around a 67 or greater uh, in terms of the course and uh, you can see in terms of uh, on the right hand side I have you know uh, what these things mean qualitatively right so a D for example uh, means you have some understanding and you're getting you're getting in the 50s usually uh, C's are, are general familiarity uh, and you know somewhat acceptable uh, and uh, so in this course that's about a 67 uh, so, by the way, the average uh, grade in this course, uh, I'm trying to remember what it was last year. Uh, traditionally, it's been around a B minus, I think. Um, so, if you're getting a 72%, uh, that's average. Uh, it's hard to hear. I know, you know, I mean, it's, uh, if you're coming right from high school, uh, it's going to be a little bit more difficult than, than what you're expecting. And I find particularly the first midterm, uh, the average tends to be a little bit lower because um, people are still learning how to study. They're still trying to figure out what their professors want from them and those kind of things. Uh, so if you're getting a B plus, you're above average, and that's great. Um, don't feel that that's an insult. Uh, that's actually a pretty decent grade. Uh, A's is where you're starting to get people that are going above and beyond, where they have a depth and a breadth that is uh, a little bit more than, uh, than, than their peers. Um, but there's the grading scheme. I have, uh, I have it on the course outline as well. And uh, after each midterm, I will update your grades and make sure that you uh, have an idea where you're at in terms of the letter grade uh, so that you know, uh, you know where you need to, to go, whether you're trying to uh, you know, go up or hopefully nobody's trying to go down. <clears throat> so please take a look at the course outline. There's, I know there's a lot of information on there, uh, but there's probably something I've forgotten to tell you. Uh, so take a look. There's lots of important things on there that uh, I, do, I do want you to take a look at and keep a copy of it uh, for future use. 
Okay, so one other thing I'm going to try uh, this semester to try to make the online stuff a little more fun is uh, there is uh, an app called Kahoot and it has little quizzes and games and stuff on it. So occasionally during lectures, I'm going to just take a break from the lecture and we're going to play a Kahoot, which is a little game. So you can download the app on your phone or tablet or whatever. And uh, when we get to that point in the lecture where we're trying a Kahoot, I will, uh, I will load it up and it will give you a little code and, and uh, you just type that code in and then you'll join the game and uh, we'll play it together. So let's try that. I think it's going to be a little bit fun. And uh, I have one today a little bit later. So if you want to download the app now, um, you'll be ready for, for when we get there. So yeah, that being said, uh, let's have some fun. Uh, I enjoy this class. This is my favorite class. This is my stuff I, I, that I like to do. I like to teach. Uh, you know, I know some people, they go on the internet and they're reading about sports or whatever. Uh, you know, when I go on the internet, I'm reading microbiology stories. Uh, this is my thing. Everybody's tired of COVID-19 and hearing about SARS coronavirus too. Um, I don't mind. I like learning about viruses and this is a new virus. And despite all the, you know, pandemonium that's going on, I, I enjoy learning about it and uh, um, pretty much uh, anything to do with microbiology. So I want to have lots of fun with you and uh, hopefully you will too. And I'm hoping um, lots of people will, you know, send me questions all the time and, and uh, I'm hoping uh, in the future I'll see you around the hallways at Cano and, uh, you know, we can have some conversations. Okay. So I think that is it for this PowerPoint. It is. Uh, I'm just going to uh, switch now and we're going to uh, take a look at topic one. So I gotta find that PowerPoint. What did I do with it? There it is. Okay, so let me share that with you now. What did I do with my screen here? Oh, there it is, okay. So there we go. Okay, so let's talk about what is microbiology. I'm, um, believe it or not, I'm actually teaching in a classroom today, uh, partly because I hate sitting. And uh, so I'll probably do that uh, in the future all the time. And uh, also my colleagues are really distracting. One of them next to me has a really loud booming voice. I can hear it through the wall all the time. Uh, so if you see me walking back and forth, or if, uh, if you can't hear me because I've, I've wandered off, please let me know. Um, I'm not necessarily paying attention to the screen as much. But uh, let's talk about microbiology. So here's an interesting thing for you. Uh, this was a study done about three years ago now, uh, looking at uh, taking air samples from people's breath and things like that. And uh, they did a calculation and they figured that we emit about 37 million bacteria per hour. That's huge. Can you just imagine that? 37 million bacteria an hour. If you're sitting beside someone in class here, uh, for an hour and a half, you would be practically breathing 50 million bacteria on them um, over a short amount of time. Uh, really, really quite incredible. So we hear about microbiology all the time in the news. Uh, believe it or not, I shared this exact story with students in January 4th, uh, this last year. You can see it's talking about a new mysterious unknown disease in China. Uh, we all know what that is now. We have a name for it, COVID-19. Uh, the disease actually was characterized in 2019, which is why it's called COVID-19. Um, uh, but uh, the virus was only actually isolated in January. Can we believe it was only January where we discovered this new virus? This is crazy. Uh, here's another news story. This is just uh, very recent. Canada has made an agreement with a vaccine manufacturer. Uh, they've got something in the pipeline, and I guess we're hoping that it works and works well. Uh, you can read about that if you want to check out the link. Um, but, uh, you know, last time I checked, there were actually 174 vaccine candidates that were in development worldwide. Uh, so uh, the article is not fully clear why Canada chose this one, but uh, uh, maybe I'll find out some more information on that in the future. So I want to show you some other uh, news articles I noticed uh, this summer. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing, actually, I noticed uh, pretty much every single year. Um, Plague is in the news. And 
these uh, these news articles, some of them are very shocking. They're talking about the plague has made a return and, you know, watch out for the plague and, uh, you know, all those kind of things. You can see these headlines. There was plague in Mongolia, so it's a little further away from home. But New Mexico and California are a lot closer to Canada, obviously. And uh, so people are watching these news and they're, they're very concerned about it. Um, because, of course, you know, we think of the plague and we think of uh, the Middle Ages and all those kind of things. So I have a little video to show you here. Um, that is uh, about the plague, and uh, it's just very short, and then we're gonna talk about a little bit. Uh, what did I do with that video? So on this one here. Okay, so I'll play that for you. So plague is caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis, and it naturally infects rodents in the Western US and in many countries around the world. In California, for example, it's endemic in ground squirrels, which means that it's actually always around. People can get infected if they're bitten by a flea that's also bitten an infected animal. And that's why today, most of the cases occur in rural or semi-rural areas where people have closer contact with wildlife. In fact, there hasn't been an urban outbreak of plague since 1925 to 25 when one struck LA. Now, there are three types of plague. The most common is called bubonic plague. This is when the bacteria travel from a flea bite to your lymph nodes. It causes flu-like symptoms and it turns your lymph nodes into painful swollen balloons called buboes, which can grow to the size of a chicken egg. Okay, I will just stop that there. Uh... Where she plays the next video. <laughs> uh, okay, back to the PowerPoint. There we go. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna be talking about the plague a little bit today. Um, that was just kind of a quick introduction. And uh, you know, just really saying that microbiology is in the news all the time, and uh, it, it is relevant to our lives. And uh, if you pay attention there, you're, you're gonna see it all over the place. And uh, you know, people have obviously lots of concerns about these things. Is the plague back? Uh, not really. Uh, if you take a look at this, this is the number of cases by country. So this is a little bit of an older map. Uh, the good news is there's no dot in Canada. There has not been a case of plague in Canada, I think since the 1930s. Um, in the United States, there's usually about something like seven to 10 cases a year. So it's not really that significant. Uh, that's about one death, by the way, uh, in, in the United States. Um, so it's not making a comeback, but it just has not really actually gone away. Uh, so we'll, we'll come back to plague uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, there's a map of where you find the plague in the United States. Uh, you probably noticed in her, in her video, she was talking about uh, how it's transmitted and it's uh, transmitted by fleas that are found on rodents. And so uh, you need rodents, rodents are found everywhere and you need fleas. Probably the, the disease can't survive in colder climates in Canada, but you can see it's mostly Western United States. Uh, here's some other microbiology news. Uh, it's not all bad stuff, right? Uh, you can see here we've got uh, microbes cleaning up oil spills. We have uh, people talking about uh, probiotics. So these are, are bacteria that are found in yogurt. And um, the interesting thing, this particular article I, I, I was looking at, and uh, they're actually finding that uh, some of these bacteria have serotonin in them. They produce serotonin. So people are probably thinking, some people are like, serotonin, no way. Other people are like, what's serotonin? Uh, so serotonin is a neurotransmitter, and um, it makes you feel good, right? Uh, and so our body produces it, you know, when we have our, you know, normal responses, you know, you see, you see someone you love, uh, you have a good experience, you make a little serotonin, you feel, you feel good. Um, so why are these bacteria making serotonin? We don't know. We have no idea. Are they affecting our moods? Um, who knows? Possibly. Uh, so this is, these are some interesting questions about, uh, about uh, research in, uh, to deal with bacteria. You can see there's another one there talking about double dipping. Uh, so if someone double dips, dips that's about 10,000 bacteria they're putting in your dip. So watch out for that, particularly if they are spreading something. But, uh, you know, for the most part, they're harmless bacteria. So what is microbiology? Uh, obviously, everybody's thinking about COVID-19. But uh, if you're like me, you're thinking about everything else, too. 
Uh, here are some of the things we're going to be talking about in this course. We're obviously focusing mostly on bacteria that are uh, directly uh, affecting our health. And uh, so there's a whole bunch of things. Maybe you've heard of some of them. Maybe you've heard of a few and not others. And uh, these are all things that we're going to be talking about in this class. So you can see some of them on there. E. coli. We're going to be talking about E. coli a lot. Uh, we're going to be talking um, a little bit about flu here and there. And uh, I have uh, added some COVID-19 material to the, to the course as well. So we can learn a little bit about that. So what is a microbe? Um, here's a little chart. You can see it, it's showing the size of things. So over on, on the right hand side, you can see there's a dog. It's very big. It's about a meter in size. And then as you go towards the left, things are getting smaller and you can see we're getting way down on the far left to an actual atom. And so I've made that box about, you know, these are things that we are going to talk about. Uh, you know, some of these things are visible to the human eye. Uh, some of these things are very small. You need a microscope. Some of the things are smaller. You need an electron microscope. Uh, so I want to show you this really cool thing. As you can see, it's linked on the left there. It's called the scale of the universe. This is super cool. Uh, I'm going to show it to you right now. Here it is. So there, there's an app for this too as well. You can, you can buy an app for your phone. And I actually bought it, it was like a dollar. And some days I just get stuck playing around with it. But I'll show you what it is. It's called the uh, scale of the universe. And let me just see if I can get rid of that ad. No, I can't get rid of the ad. That's great. So you can, you can sort of zoom in on things, right? So you can see there's a, there's a human there. Ah, this ad is really kind of annoying. It's not working very well for some reason on my touch screen. Ah, maybe, let's see here. That ad is getting in the way, I think. Well, I apologize for this, but uh, you can zoom in and zoom out. I encourage you to check it out. You can zoom in and zoom out. If you zoom out, you can see how big the planets are and you can even see how big the uh, the, the galaxy is and you can click on things. I think there's even the Minecraft world in there, which is apparently bigger than planet Earth. And they've got little, you know, you can click on it. It's got little information about it. You can zoom in and you can see some really tiny things, which I was hoping to do, but this is just not really working well for me at the moment. Let's see here. I can try to zoom in a little bit. So I apologize for that. Um, I guess we'll just go back to the PowerPoint, but it's a very cool tool. So I check, I encourage you to go check out the, uh, um, check out the link here that I have on the PowerPoint and uh, you can you can play around with that. It's very, very neat. So just a quick segue here. Um, I'm going to just uh, see here, change screens again. So if you downloaded the first set of notes, uh, you may have noticed, I just want to point out a couple of things on the notes. Uh, you know, it starts off with the text references and some of the things we're going to talk about. You can see it's going right into the notes. In some places, the notes will have things like this. Uh, so this is a, uh, a little table for you to fill in uh, uh, during the lecture. And uh, I'm going to actually uh, uh, fill that in right now. So I'm going to just switch. I have a little whiteboard thingy here. No, not that one. Where is it? Uh, oh, here it is. Okay, so I just want to fill that in and uh, kind of just, you know, as an introduction to some of the microbes that we're going to be talking about. So you can see I have them classified as large, medium, small, tiny, and I even have extremely tiny. So I'll get over to that in a moment. So what do I mean by large? So by large, oops, I got to get the pencil here. Large, I mean, greater than 1,000 micrometers. So what is a micrometer? That means greater than one millimeter, by the way. So one micrometer, by the way, micro is that fancy little uh, uh, Greek symbol. It's, uh, it's actually called a mu. It looks like a little mu. One micrometer is equal to one over a thousand millimeters. So it's a very small number that are, you're looking at under a microscope. So what is bigger than a millimeter? 
So some of the things that we're gonna be talking about include things like uh, worms. And lice. So those are really most of the things we're gonna be talking about that are larger than one meter. Most of the things we're gonna talk about are much smaller. So we're looking at the medium category here. So by medium, I mean 10 to uh, 100 micrometers. So by the way, 100 micrometers, that's about the thickness of your hair. Uh, and that's uh, anything skinnier is, is a little bit smaller than, than what your eye can actually make out. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about amoeba. We're talking about things like algae. Although not so much of algae in this class because they're not usually making us sick. And we're also talking about protozoans. Okay, so you don't know what those things are. So by small, even smaller than that. So 0 0.1 to about 10 micrometers. So in this case here, mostly we're talking about bacteria. So bacteria, we cannot see it with our eyeball. You need a full work. You don't need an electron microscope for that. So what do I mean by tiny? Oops. By tiny, I mean 0 0.01. I have a question. 0 0.1 micrometers. So, uh, yes. Um, is there music playing in your Good background? Good question. Do you have uh, music? There, you know what, it's probably that. Yeah, let me just get rid of that. There we go. Sorry mm -hmm. about that. Okay. I think that was that, um, the uh, scale of the universe thing. Apologize. Uh, yeah, so tiny is, is uh, really I'm talking about viruses in this case. So viruses are so small, we cannot see them with a regular microscope. You need an electron microscope for that. We're talking about which falls into that last category of extremely tiny. So by extremely tiny, we're talking about in the nanometer range, so maybe 10 uh, 1 to 10 nanometers or 0 0.01 uh, micrometers. And in this case here, we're talking about something called prions. These are infectious proteins. So we're going to be talking about prions in, uh, in topic 6. And uh, uh, there are, they cause things like these. So there's the table there uh, for to fill out. Um, I'll go back to the, the PowerPoint here. Uh, if you need to catch up on that, you can, you can check out the video once I get it uh, uploaded. Okay, so five areas of microbiology we're talking about in, in this class. So bacteriology, hopefully that one's obvious. That's a study of bacteria. Virology is a study of viruses. Mycology, that might be a new one for you. That means a study of fungi and yeast. Uh, Mike, M-Y-C, uh, usually has something to do with uh, fungi or yeast. Uh, I think it has to do with the Latin or something like that. Parasitology. Um, you would think it would be the study of parasites, but when, in a medical perspective, we're mostly talking about larger things, uh, so worms and protozoans. Uh, we're not usually talking about bacteria in that case. So we'll talk about that in, I think that's topic five. Uh, immunology, hopefully that one's obvious as well, uh, the study of immunity or uh, understanding how the body resists infection. So I just want to point out, like I said before, uh, there are a lot of good microbes out there uh, that are doing all sorts of things other than causing disease. In fact, a very small percentage of the microorganisms on the planet actually affect humans' health uh, at all. Uh, many of the microbes on the planet fall into this category. They're photosynthetic and they're part of the food chain. So these little ones here are called cyanobacteria. Uh, so this, uh, this word here, cyan, I think I can circle it. There we go. So that kind of means this, this color here, this uh, uh, kind of, uh, it's bluish with a little bit of a green in it and almost a turquoise. Uh, you see these, if, you ever, if you're ever driving along on the highway, you see a swamp and it's that color, it's loaded with these bacteria. Uh, we're not exactly sure, but uh, some people estimate that uh, these things probably produce half of the oxygen on the planet. So that's a good thing. These are good microbes. 
Uh, here's some other microbes. These are just really cool to look at. These are called diatoms. Uh, they're part of the food chain. So very, very important for, uh, for the planet. Uh, many microorganisms are involved in decomposition and nutrient cycling. So you can see in this case here, uh, this is showing uh, um, and the nitrogen uh, uh, cycle. The nitrogen goes from the atmosphere into the soil, and that's uh, thanks to these microbes. So that's a good thing. Uh, many we do make use of in our industries. So uh, many are, are part of our food products. So you can see in this case here, it's just saying that, hey, we're using bacterial cultures to make cheese. And if you like cheese, then that's good. Cheese can be very yummy. Uh, some of you may like blue cheese. Um, blue cheese, what is that blue stuff? Well, it turns out that that is actually a type of mold that gives it that crazy strong flavor. I will not judge you if you like blue cheese, but I don't like it. <laughs> uh, what other things are we making? We're making yogurt, probably uh, even some of you make yogurt at home sometimes and basically are culturing bacteria, good bacteria that is making the food product. Uh, we use yeast to make uh, carbon dioxide, and so that is in bread, uh, makes the bread rise, and without it, it can taste very, very badly. I made pizza once and forgot to add the yeast, and that did not turn out so well. Uh, many people uh, probably are familiar with uh, alcoholic beverages, and of course, uh, in that case, we have microorganisms, usually yeast being used to make uh, ethanol, and ethanol is, is what makes it alcoholic. I'm just gonna show you this picture here. This I found in my email a few years ago, and uh, the Canadian beer fridge, I thought that was kind of cute. Um, hopefully it gives you a chuckle. Uh, so what else are these microbes doing? Many, many things. Uh, I could make a huge long list. I was gonna show you this last thing here. This is the uh, wastewater treatment plant in Fort McMurray. And uh, so what's going on there? Uh, the wastewater treatment plant is almost entirely microbiological. Uh, they're not using a lot of chemicals at all. Most of the treatment, the water is sitting in these ponds and letting the microbes uh, eat all of the uh, organics and nitrates and phosphates. And, uh, and then they clean the water. It's really quite an incredible process. It goes from one pond to the next pond. It starts out relatively dirty. By the time it gets to the last pond, it's cleaner than what you'd find in the river. It's really quite incredible. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, some biology here uh, and uh, about relationships. Uh, so you may have heard in biology the term uh, symbiosis. Uh, that means living together. And I, I want to introduce a couple of other terms. Mutualism is where both organisms benefit. Commensalism, where one benefits and the other isn't affected. And parasitism is really what we're talking about when we're talking about disease. So I'll give you some examples for each of these. Probably everyone, I'm hoping everyone has seen Finding Nemo. Wonderful movie. Um, it's explained right in the movie, what is going on with the clownfish and the anemone, right? So the clownfish, it goes into the anemone and it hides there and the anemone is protecting it because the anemone uh, actually will sting other fish. The clownfish has uh, a mucus on its, uh, on its surface that protects it from getting stung. Uh, and the anemone is benefiting because the clownfish is going in there and it's eating uh, parasites. So it's a mutualistic relationship. This is good. Uh, when we're talking about microorganisms, uh, many of our relationships with these things is also mutual. So for example, E. coli, everyone thinks E. coli bad. E. coli, no, no, no. E. coli is usually your friend. Uh, it's living in your gut, it's living in your intestine. And uh, for E. coli, that's a great place to be. It's warm, it's moist, we're stuffing food in our faces and, uh, and feeding E. coli all the time. What is E. coli doing for us? It's actually producing uh, vitamins for us, folic acid and vitamin K. And in some cases, uh, helping us to digest uh, other foods such as, such as um, uh, milk. Um, so it's a good thing, it's a mutualistic relationship, usually. Uh, we're at the point now where you can see probiotics all over the place where people are uh, you know, putting microorganisms into products and the idea is that you know, it's gonna help us if we eat these things. We'll talk more about probiotics in future lectures. So what's commensalism? Commensalism is where one organism um, is benefiting and the other really not so much. Um, it's kind of neutral. So here's an interesting case. I just, uh, you know, I saw this picture. I really thought it was a very beautiful picture. Um, you've got these pilot fish. 
And these pilot fish, they hang around these sharks. And when the sharks, you know, feast on something, the pilot fish go in and they scavenge, uh, you know, some of the leftovers. And, and the shark isn't really benefiting that that much. Um, as far as I know, he doesn't usually snack on these things. I'm not really sure why that is, but uh, it's an interesting case of commensalism. Uh, here's a commensal microorganism. This is Staphylococcus epidermidis. So you probably know just from reading the name, epidermidis, epidermis means your skin. So this lives on our skin. As far as we know, it doesn't seem to really do us anything for us. It just kind of sits there, um, but we're providing it at home. So this is a commensal relationship. We're giving it a home and food and it's not really doing anything uh, for us. Uh, once in a while, people do get infections from it and that's where things would obviously turn parasitic. So parasitism, this is where we're talking about disease, where uh, you know one organism is benefiting and the other is uh, you know, having some sort of detrimental effect. It, it could be uh, minor or it could be major problems. Uh, obviously, uh, in some cases, we're looking at serious disease. In some cases, we're looking at minimal disease. But we're going to talk a lot about, uh, obviously, uh, organisms that cause a disease in this course. Okay, so I have a Kahoot for you. So if you've downloaded the app, you can load that up. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to start that up here in a moment. Uh, where is it now? Okay, so let's do that. So if you look at that, let's see here. I think it should be getting, there we go. So enter the game pin and uh, we'll play that in a moment. Okay, so I'm going to start that for 20 seconds here, whether you're doing it or not, you can join in part way. This is just, a, a, just testing it out to try it out. So there's only three questions, and you can see how you fare uh, once, you, uh, uh, once we try it out here. Okay, so here goes. Job on ketchup. Ketchup is mostly vinegar and flavor and tomatoes, of course. The other ones are produced by bacteria or yeast. Okay, so I think it gives you, it looks like it gives you a score by how fast you answered. So good job. All right, good job. Hope you like the little jokes I put in on that one. <laughs> All right, okay, same person in the lead. One last one. Okay, so that one was a little bit harder. That's okay. That was in the video I showed you, uh, but we haven't really talked about Black Death a lot. Um, but hopefully you like the Kahoot. So I'm hoping to do at least one of those per lecture and uh, 
you know, so you have a little bit of fun and I can sort of gauge, uh, you know, whether people are learning the material or not. Um, so let me just go back to PowerPoint here. Uh, there it is there. And uh, so stay tuned with that. Have your uh, phone ready for next lecture with the Kahoot and I'll have a different quiz for us. So let's talk a little bit about PLAG. Um, not going to go into a huge history lesson on this, but you probably know that plague is bad, very bad. It was actually known as the Black Death in the Middle Ages and killed a lot of people. Uh, if you're looking at a pandemic, this was it. Uh, we don't really know how many. But some people say maybe a quarter of the population in Europe uh, and uh, possibly something similar in Asia. The records in Asia are a little uh, not quite as good. Uh, some people are saying 50%. We don't really know. Uh, very hard to get those exact numbers, but it was a very bad thing. So our current pandemic is pretty good if you think about it in that context. Uh, so why is it called the Black Death? Um, partly because of, uh, of these buboes. So maybe when you're little, I know sometimes you might hear parents say things like, uh, you get hurt and your parent might say, uh, Oh, did you get a boo-boo? Um, this is the origin of that word, right? And buboes actually means these swollen lymph glands and uh, they, um, uh, the tissue gets necrotic and it gets black and so it's called the black death. Uh, there's actually three types of plague. Uh, the the uh, bubonic plague means you're getting the buboes, it's in the lymph nodes. Uh, and if you were a person in the Middle Ages getting the plague, so we're talking about 1300s, uh, maybe 1340s, I think it was, uh, you know, you've got about a 60% chance of death. Um, there's also pneumonic plague. Pneumonic plague means is kind of like pneumonia. So it's where people start getting in lungs and it's more like a 90% chance of death. Uh, if you get, sit, uh, if you get it in the blood, it's something like 98, 99% chance of blood. So usually that's what happens when people nowadays die of the plague is they end up getting it in the blood and it's too late and it's very hard to treat. Uh, most people who do get plague, though, it is treatable with antibiotics. It's just uh, if, as long as it's detected in time, because uh, it's not something that's necessarily on the mind of healthcare workers, and so uh, they may not catch it. So here is the agent of plague, Yersinia pestis. Uh, this is a bacteria. It actually looks a lot like E. coli under a microscope. Uh, it just has nasty, nasty toxins and a few other uh, uh, tricks up its sleeve. Um, but it is caused by a bacteria and it's spread by fleas. So this is the big thing is the fleas get infected in their gut and then they will bite something else. Uh, and usually it's a flea rodent kind of thing. But sometimes, of course, rodents do come in contact with humans. So you can see here's the flea and the, uh, and the rodent thing going on. Uh, it doesn't have to be rats. Rats were probably the agent in the Middle Ages, uh, but we can have all sorts of ground squirrels and uh, um, there was some sort of, uh, what I'm thinking it was called, uh, a girl got plagued a few years ago. I think it was a prairie dog. She picked up some roadkill. It was a prairie dog or something like that. And uh, so, you know, if you are in the Western United States, do not pick up roadkill. Uh, sometimes humans kind of end up, you know, like I said, interacting with uh, uh, interacting with the rodents and the fleas just jump on and they bite the humans and that's when the humans get the disease. So just want to kind of backtrack and talk a little bit about uh, some important historical uh, uh, parts in, in microbiology and, uh, you know, that's kind of most of the re rest of the lecture. Um, so hopefully, we'll, you know, I'll be done on time for sure. If there's anything that spills over to next day, it's not really a big deal. Uh, we already talked about production of alcohol. Uh, obviously, this is a very old form of microbiology. People had no idea that yeast lived on grapes. And uh, they just knew that if you put the grapes in a barrel and you squish them up, eventually, uh, sometimes you've got a, a good wine and sometimes you've got a bunch of spoiled grapes because there are other things that can live on grapes and, and actually make very terrible things. So if you go way back, we're talking about, uh, do I have a date on there? I guess I don't have a date on there. I'm trying to think if this was the 16 or 1700s. I think it was the 1600s. Um, this particular figure here, Robert Hooke, uh, he was one of these scientists in, in, uh, in England and he was a wealthy guy and he did a little bit of everything. 
he got himself a telescope and this was the era where people were making all sorts of interesting discoveries with telescopes and he got himself a microscope as well. There's his microscope there. You can see uh, you've got uh, an ocular lens over here. You've got another lens is down here. The specimen would be down there somewhere. And this thing over here is actually a lamp, an oil lamp. And he published. Here was the other thing. Here's some of the things he saw. He looked at some, some very cool things. He looked at insect eyes, so why not? They're very cool. There's a flea, there's some snowflakes. And one of the important things he looked at were, uh, was cork. So cork, you know, you put it in a bottle of wine, for example. And uh, where does it come from? It's, it's actually uh, an organism. It's actually an animal. And uh, he saw these uh, things in there, you know, these little repeated structures, and he called them cells. You know, like, like prison cells or cells that a monk would live in, right? These repeating rooms. So he coined the name cells. Uh, so at this time, not everyone owned a microscope. There were, you know, probably less than 10 in, in all of London uh, at the time, and, and other Europeans started to produce them. Uh, this guy here started to make his own microscopes. Uh, his name was uh, Antony van Leeuwenhoek. He was a Dutchman. If you take a look at his microscope, what you're looking at right here, circling in red, that's the lens. So his microscope was not much fancier than a magnifying glass. It just had a special uh, mount, mounting uh, device where he could focus it and bring samples in. You can see he's just using the sunlight, uh, nothing too fancy. Uh, it turned out this guy was very, very, very good at making lenses. In fact, he was so good that no one knew how to make lenses as good as him until like 100 years later. So this guy was a little different. He wasn't just looking at little things that he wanted to see in more detail, like a bug's eye or a snowflake. Uh, this guy started to look at Here's something that he looked at one day. Let's see if I can load this up. Things like rainwater. So historically, think about it. What could be more pure than rainwater? It, it's, it's water. It's pure. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And so he looks at rainwater and he finds things that are moving around. And, you know, they kind of look like little animals. So, but they're small, like molecules. So the name animalcules came out of this. And, uh, so he started looking at all sorts of things and made probably hundreds of biological discoveries. Uh, really quite amazing. I'll show you some of the things that he, uh, he had uh, published. So if you take a look at this here, a uh, number of these things are organisms that yeah, you would find in water or liquids. So this uh, rotifer here, this is a, uh, uh, basically a pond organism. Um, he discovered red blood cells. Right before microscopes, people just they knew red was a sticky red the blood was a red, sticky substance, but what exactly did it do? Uh, and he discovered red blood cells. He discovered, uh, he looked at, the number of things he looked at was unbelievable. Um, he looked at his dog's feces. He looked at his own feces when he was healthy and then noticed it was different when he was sick. Uh, he even, uh, he was the discoverer of, of sperm, so he looked at semen. Uh, you can just imagine the types of biological discoveries. In fact, so many people did not believe him. And he said, well, why don't you come on by? And he would show them his microscopes and show them all his discoveries. Uh, so pretty cool stuff. Uh, you can see I have here on the right bacteria. He was probably, possibly the first person to observe or at least write about bacteria historically. Um, so obviously a very important uh, discovery. So the next part of the story, you can see this is, this is a number of years later. People are trying to figure out what these bacteria are. What are they doing? They seem to be everywhere when you look. Um, so, uh, and, and they're spoiling things, right? Uh, but we, we didn't know that at the time. Um, so, enter this guy, Louis Pasteur, who, who's, who's studying um, bacteria and, and trying to understand what they do. And uh, there was this debate at the time around something called spontaneous generation that I'm not going to get into. But the question was, how did this, how, did, how does food spoil, for example, right? So past year, for example, was looking at, you can see this flask here. And uh, it, uh, uh, you can imagine if this was uh, any kind of food, you, you leave it out on the countertop, eventually something's going to get in there and it's going to spoil and it's putrid, right? So imagine this is your soup. But at the time, there was an argument as exactly how that happened. Did it just spoil spontaneously? Uh, there were theories around it. And he was trying to prove that it was microorganisms that were causing the spoilage. 
So he came up with a, a relatively brilliant experiment that we call now the swan necked flask. So swan, like the bird. All right, so he, he put some broth in this flask and he heated up the glass and bent it to this funny curved shape. And uh, then he would boil the broth so you can sterilize it, you can kill anything in the broth and you can see it's open to the air. So if there are any microorganisms in the air, which is what he was trying to demonstrate, they can't fall in the broth. They can sort of fall in the neck and sort of get stuck in there. And that's what they did. And he actually would have these things and they wouldn't spoil. And uh, proving that it was the bacteria causing the spoilage, he would then break the neck and open it to the air and show that, that the microorganisms were causing the spoilage. There's one of his flasks. So this is what, 150 years later, we still have one of his flasks and it still hasn't uh, spoiled. Uh, and that's somewhere in, I believe it's the Pasteur Institute in, in Paris. So Pasteur was on to something. Food can be spoiled by bacteria. It wasn't long before he started connecting that to what about the human body? Can the human body be spoiled or at least disease being caused by bacteria? So that's kind of an important uh, concept. He also invented pasteurization, by the way, named after his name, Louis Pasteur. And he started linking microorganisms to diseases. So this was very, very important. Uh, later in his life, he actually developed a bunch of vaccines. We're gonna talk about vaccines uh, another day later on in the semester. Uh, I also wanna talk about Robert Koch for a moment. Um, so this is a German guy, and he actually was contemporary with, with Pasteur. And by the way, they kind of hated each other. You know, it's one of these rivalries that you hear about where, you know, um, the French have their famous guy and, and the French all loved him. And then the Germans had their famous guy and the Germans all loved him. But, you know, of course, the, you know, they couldn't love the French guy because they're Germans. And anyway, it was kind of an interesting little Sunday rivalry. But he was looking at uh, animals were getting sick with something called anthrax. Uh, so anthrax is something we're going to talk about a little bit too uh, in the next in the next few weeks. Um, but it used to be a huge issue with livestock uh, animals getting anthrax. So he wanted to prove that that particular bacterium, the one I just showed you in the previous slide, so it kind of looks like that, uh, was the actual cause of anthrax. So how do you prove that scientifically? So he went through and he wanted to develop a whole bunch of techniques to kind of prove this. And he ended up uh, coming up with an experiment that we now know as, as Koch's postulist. So it was really four things he was looking at. And, and at the time we didn't have anything like this. And so it was actually an important kind of breakthrough in trying to connect particular microorganisms to particular diseases. So first part of his postulates is he said, you know, the, the microbe must be found in the sick animals and not the healthy ones. Okay, so you're trying to connect it, connect that microbe to uh, to disease. Uh, number two, taking that microbe and growing it in the lab and isolating it in something called a pure culture. Why is this important? Because if I go and if I were to come and, and uh, you know, swab the palm of your hand and uh, try to grow the bacteria on there, I would probably get easily uh, a dozen species, uh, possibly a hundred species. So you want to figure out which exact organism is the cause rather than, you know, looking at, uh, at dozens of them. So growing things in a pure culture is important. You can grow in the culture, you can characterize it, you can see what it looks like under a microscope, you can give it a name, all those kind of things. The next step is introducing it to a healthy animal. And the last step is kind of the repeat part where you're actually uh, re-isolating the same organism from the newly sick animals. So this was a huge, huge uh, breakthrough, like I said, in, in connecting things to disease. And after Koch did this, uh, all sorts of diseases were connected to, to microorganisms uh, by doing these kind of experiments. Now keep in mind, this did not work for everything. You can see the important parts of the postulates. For example, number two, it says the uh, organism must be grown in a pure culture. So what if you can't grow the organism in a pure culture? Uh, then this makes it very, very difficult to uh, uh, you know, connected to disease. And so things like chlamydia, for example, a sexually transmitted disease, it took us a long time to connect that organism to the disease because we still to this day cannot actually grow it in an actual culture. Uh, you can see another thing is that it's got to make the animals sick. Koch himself was looking at cholera and it turns out cholera doesn't make everybody sick. 
Some people get sick from it and some people don't. So you, you know, look at these things. Obviously, this doesn't deal with things like genetic diseases or lifestyle diseases. You know, for example, getting lung cancer from being a, a uh, from from uh, smoking or, being, or from other environmental exposures, uh, but it is a very useful principle connecting uh, something to disease. Uh, the other thing is there may be ethical considerations why you can't do this. Uh, for example, COVID-19 is a good example uh, where uh, there's not really a good animal model. So if you can't do it in animals, uh, we do have a mouse model now, which is which is great. Um, but you can't just go around infecting humans to see, okay, does this cause, cause a person to be sick? That wouldn't be very nice. You'd probably get put in jail for that. So here's some of Koch's uh, discoveries. You can see tuberculosis, cholera, a whole bunch of other things he had discovered. Um, and so this has been called by historians, uh, the germ theory of disease. So this is, like I said, huge, huge, very, very important. Uh, part of our, of our history. Uh, there's a bunch of other people that are worth mentioning. Um, this, this guy has an interesting story, but I want to just point out the date. So look at Koch, 1880s. This guy here, 1847. Um, really sad story. This guy actually was an uh, was administrator in a hospital, and he noticed that uh, for some reason, in the one wing, almost every woman who arrived who was pregnant was, was dying in child. From infection after childbirth. Uh, so, you know, what was going on? He, he had no idea. He tested a whole bunch of things. For example, you know, maybe the women needed to lie on their side or their back. Uh, that didn't seem to make a difference. Um, you know, maybe it had something to do with, you know, every day, at, you know, there was, this, uh, um, there was this church nearby and this bell was ringing. So he asked them to stop ringing the bell. Uh, eventually, he found, he decided, okay, people need to wash their hands. I'll get back to that in a second. Like, people need to wash their hands. And when he made them wash their hands, the deaths went down dramatically. We still have the numbers of this day. Incredible. You know what happened? He got fired. Everyone complained. They're like, why do we have to wash our hands? This guy is an idiot. Please stop, you know, fire him. So they fired him. Um, and why, why? Because people, this is 30 years before the germ theory of disease. People were, were not thinking disease is caused by microorganisms at the time. Uh, people had all sorts of other theories around it, things like bad odors. So people thought that maybe bad odors were causing disease, not the bacteria. Why wash your hands? So it seems kind of funny. People are still ar arguing about washing their hands nowadays. Kind of, kind of unfortunate. Um, here's another historical figure. I'm just going to finish up here in a moment. I'm trying not to go over time. Uh, Joseph Lister you may have recognized Listerine. Uh, he was using this principle to save people in surgery when he started realizing we got to clean this place, people have to wash their hands, and people were not dying from surgery anymore. I'll come back to vaccines later. Uh, this is the golden era of microbiology where we had discovered many important things that are still affecting us and helping human health today. Uh, you can see if you take a look at this, this is the last 120 years where we're looking at a huge, huge change in human mortality from, uh, from infectious disease. And, uh, you know, uh, it's just plummeted and, and we really are very fortunate to be living nowadays. So you can take a look through the notes. I just want to finish off and show you what's going on at the end of my notes. I have some concepts. I have some terms. So you can take a look at that. Uh, it's very important that after a lecture, you do go through these terms and make sure you understand what they are. Uh, take a look through the textbook or Google them and figure out, you know, if you don't know these things, use them. Uh, make them part of your language so that you can go home and, uh, and really talk the talk and it'll help you on, on your tests. I have references for the textbook and I usually have some study questions. Now these are not exam questions, by the way, uh, but this is where I look. I look at the end of my notes uh, for ideas for exam questions. These are usually a bit, a little bit more open-ended kind of bigger picture kind of things. Uh, my exam questions are going to be a lot more specific usually uh, to, uh, because it's, I mean, I can't just ask you these kind of questions all the time or you're going to write me essays. Um, and I can't be uh, marking 50 essays for, for the exam. But go here and, and make sure you go through the study questions and work through them if you don't know what they are, because uh, these are some of the really important points uh, for the lectures. Uh, 
Usually I'll try to have some additional resources. So here are some here for topic one. Uh, the last thing I wanted to point out is this here, is this YouTube page. Uh, I put that together and that's probably where I'm gonna be putting these lectures once I figure out uh, uh, how to access the recordings and all that. And I will on Moodle put a link to the playlist for this course. I will have the lectures posted there. And I also have uh, any other uh, videos that I, I think are, are kind of interesting or relevant to the particular topic. Okay, so that is it uh, for today. Uh, so thank you for coming to class. Uh, if you, uh, you know, have any questions, feel free to give me a phone call or, or send me an email anytime. And I will see you on Thursday.